this weapon, which just failed to bag me a shorebird, is called an otolotl. Early Utahns used it, oh, 10 or 12,000 years ago. They killed small game and even antelope with it here along the edges of the Great Salt Lake. If I put a dart or short spear into this notch, I can gain considerable leverage and launch it much more forcibly than I could with just my arm alone. And if I happen to be gifted with the skills of the ancient hunter, I just might bring home some fresh game for supper. The otolotl is to spear throwing what the sling is to rock throwing. For thousands of years, the otolotl was just about the only technology known to the early inhabitants of Utah. Having so few tools, they developed a relationship with the Great Basin landscape that was markedly different from ours today. While modern man finds his sustenance chiefly in the mountains, our predecessors drew their resources from the marshes and especially those around the Great Salt Lake. They found food and shelter in places modern man wouldn't even think to look. Utah's earliest peoples regrettably didn't read or write, nor did they come in contact with anyone who could. All we know of them is what we can infer from the artifacts they left behind, a worn sandal, a food cache, a stone house, a milkweed net, even human droppings. From such artifacts, anthropologists have ingeniously pieced together a sketch of Utah's prehistory, but enormous gaps remain. We have only vague notions of how many people lived here at various prehistoric periods. Once we thought that only a few bands passed through on occasional migrations, but recent research suggests that there may have been fairly large groups living settled lives along the shores of the Great Salt Lake and other waterways. Some evidence suggests that there was considerable continuity between successive groups occupying the area, but other evidence indicates there may have been long periods of near total depopulation between in-migrations. Many mysteries remain and what we think we know is subject to radical revision as more artifacts are unearthed. The best scientific opinion leads us to believe that the first Utahns, or at least their ancestors, came from Siberia. They didn't require any skills in shipbuilding or navigation to cross over into Alaska, however. They simply walked on dry land. Around 20,000 years ago, the formation of ice packs in the north apparently reduced the level of the sea enough to expose a broad plain called Beringia, where the Bering Strait now is. I doubt that a prehistoric Asian Columbus chanced upon the route and returned to start a mass exodus. More likely, these peoples gradually expanded their habitat over generations until some found themselves in America. The setting of their migrations must have been spectacular. Great Alaskan mountains surrounded them, the slopes and peaks heavily glaciated. They were able to survive the freezing cold only because a network of low river valleys provided enough warmth and game to sustain life. This network gradually led them south and east, a course that would take their descendants many generations later into the American Northwest. No longer locked up by formidable mountains, they spread out in all directions, some eventually making their way to Utah. Around 12,000 years ago, a band of prehistoric migrants trudged up over a rise and looked out on a panorama similar to this. Unfortunately, we have no record of their thoughts on first seeing Utah's valleys. But the record of a much later group provides an instructive contrast. In September of 1776, a small band of Spanish explorers under Father Francisco Atanasio Dominguez crossed into Utah Valley from the east by way of Spanish Fork Canyon. This is very much like the scene that greeted them as well. Father Velez de Escalante, a co-leader of the expedition, described in his journal what it was that attracted their attention as they looked across the valley. Among the objects of their interest were the towering Wasatch Mountains. They were delighted, as they put it, with the abundance of firewood and timber in the adjacent Sierra. However, to the prehistoric migrants, timber meant little 
They didn't live in log houses and had only primitive stone axes for felling large trees. Moreover, the edible plants of the mountain forest were unreliable as staples because they were covered by snow during the winter months. Along the valley floor, the Spaniards also observed many sheltered spots, water and pasturages for raising cattle, sheep, and horses. But pasture was of no use to ancient people who didn't raise domesticated animals. The Spaniards were especially pleased to discover that the valley floor, as Escalante put it, is watered by four medium-sized rivers and is flat, and with the exception of the marshes along the lake's edges, of very good farmland quality for all kinds of crops. It's ironic that when the first Utahns looked out over a similar scene, they probably headed directly for the areas that the Spaniards found least desirable, the marshes along the lake's edges. After all, what did it matter to them that the ground was level enough to plow, or that there were streams in abundance? They knew nothing of farming. To them, the marshes were the sign of abundance, teeming with birds and small animals, glutted with cattails and edible plants. These contrasts remind us that human perception, what we see, is very much limited by human experience. Because of their experience in satisfying their most primal needs, these earliest peoples perceived a very different Utah than the European explorers who came here in 1776. And more importantly, they tended to settle in the areas they saw as most fruitful, where water meets land. Near the water's edge, the earliest Paleo-Indians, as they're called, found not only small game, but signs of big game, and not just deer and elk, but huge bison, mastodons, and giant sloths. It must have been a great achievement to bag one of these prehistoric creatures. The first great basin peoples hunted them with thrusting spears tipped by beautifully crafted fluted points. Several of these points have been found in the broader region. They may also have driven the animals into bogs or off cliffs, and then finish them off with their spears, as historic tribes are known to have done. Such heroic feats could not have been terribly common, however. Over centuries, the megafauna disappeared altogether. And a very different civilization can be discerned here by about 6,000 BC, known as the Desert Archaic. At some point, a band of these early Utahns chanced upon this cave, located west of the Great Salt Lake. They decided it would do nicely as a home and took up residence. And once settled in, they tended to hold on to their lease. Hog Up Cave, as we call it today, was occupied off and on clear into our time, a period of some 8,000 years. This diorama, constructed by the Utah Museum of Natural History, recreates a day in the life of a group of these archaic Utahns. We know something of their lifestyle today because, fortunately, these folks weren't very tidy. They dropped table scraps, bits of broken basket, worn moccasins onto the floor of their dirt cave home, and then just left them there. Layers of artifacts thus deposited tell us much about ancient man in Utah. The diorama shows people trapping rabbit and duck, but recent research suggests that the lowly cattail, together with such salt-tolerant plants as pickleweed, burrowweed, and sedge, were the basic diet for many archaic peoples. Red meat was for them, as it is becoming for us, something of a luxury. Life wasn't all just hunting and gathering, however, as these decorated gaming sticks and split twig animals suggest. Closely tied to the Great Salt Lake and other waterways, the fortunes of the archaic peoples were determined by changes in climate and water levels. Dr. David Madsen, the Utah State archaeologist, has concluded that from 6500 BC to 3500 BC, those around the Great Salt Lake lived a very settled life. Their population even expanded as receding waters exposed more lake edge resources. Eventually, however, the waters dropped so low that groundwater feeding the marshes dried up. This forced the people to draw on upland resources such as Indian rice grass, mountain sheep, deer, and rabbit, but only in seasonal migration, as they probably retained the vast lake edge as a home base. 
About 1500 BC, the fickle lake waters begin to rise again. They eventually reach levels not previously known to human settlers, covering up many habitats completely. The waters were then too high for marsh and lake edge subsistence. The population declined drastically. After 6,000 years, the archaic peoples very possibly disappeared altogether. They left empty lands to later people whose presence we do not discern until a thousand years later. Around 500 AD, the people who painted these haunting pictographs began to spread over much of Utah. They are commonly called the Fremont peoples. The lives of the Fremont were in some ways very much like those of the archaic people enough so that one is tempted to see them as descendants who through contact with others picked up enough new habits and new tools to make them appear to be an entirely different race. Certainly they, like the archaic, preferred to live mainly in those narrow stretches of Utah where water meets land. But whatever their habitat or ancestry, their new technologies were enough in my judgment to make them a notably different people. For example, I can shoot this projectile much further and with far greater accuracy using this bow, which the archaic people didn't have, than I could ever dream of doing with the atlatl of the archaic people. Because the Fremont had the bow and arrow, they were able to bag game much more consistently than their predecessors. But this is only the beginning. The caves of the archaic peoples may have been convenient as homes, one quick check to make sure the previous occupants, whether man or beast, have moved on and you're ready to move in. But they tended to be rather drafty and clammy and awkwardly situated. Somewhere, the Fremont peoples learned to build their own shelters. Their shelters were partially underground with poles and dirt forming a roof. Smoke and people could emerge from the house through a hole in the ceiling. They were thus much more cozy in scale than, say, Hog Up Cave. More importantly, such shelters could be built wherever food and water were available. In addition to the pit houses, the Fremont constructed granaries above ground made of adobe or unmortared stone. Frequently, two or three of the houses and granaries were clustered together to form a tiny village. Granaries, you say? But where did they learn to farm? Well, we don't know that for sure either. But early on, they begin growing maize, or what we'd call corn, and probably beans and squash. They grew a particular variety of dented corn that was drought resistant, had a short growing season, and probably was native to the Great Basin. Though they didn't farm extensively, it's clear that they often supplemented their diet with homegrown vegetables. They also made pottery, a simple gray product that was adapted to many uses, such as boiling water, uses unknown to the archaic peoples whose only vessels were woven baskets or animal skins. We know very little of their cultural and religious life. Numerous pictographs are very distinctive with horned, triangular-shaped human figures, often wearing loincloths and sometimes surrounded by stylized deer, sheep, or other animals. The pictograph style is echoed in these charming clay figurines found at a number of Fremont sites, sometimes together with foodstuffs. The figurines are very carefully made of unfired clay and painted in shades of ochre, tan, and green. We don't know what these figurines or pictographs meant to those who made them. Some think, however, that because they're associated with game and crops, they were magical charms invoking successful hunts and harvests. Fremont decorative arts can also be seen in jewelry and in pottery. Designs were pressed into wet clay and in later periods also painted. These clay balls must have been used for games of some kind, and these incised bone gaming devices were probably used like our modern dominoes or dice. Both are found among the Fremont as well as among the archaic peoples. <laughs> 
The Fremont people probably lived in family groupings or clans. But their range of commerce and contact with other groups was undoubtedly much greater than we might suppose. It's generally believed that agriculture and pottery making originated in the South, and that these, as well as other aspects of Fremont culture, came from central Arizona and western New Mexico. These clay pots, one from Arizona, the other from Utah, illustrate the point. Others, however, have noted obvious borrowings from Plains Indians. This paddle and anvil vessel, for instance, looks similar to artifacts from the Great Plains. Some even speculate that the Fremont peoples originally came from the plains. Whatever their origins, it's clear that Utah's Fremont people were not as isolated and provincial as is often assumed. They freely borrowed and adapted from others. Indeed, their culture can be seen as an amalgam of influences surrounding them both in space and time. In their own distinctive way, they drew in all directions from survival skills others had developed to cope with their harsh basin and range in Colorado Plateau environments. Their panoply of skills wasn't enough, however, to sustain them through the peaceful yet ultimately devastating incursion of the Shoshonean peoples of historic times. The Shoshoneans entered the area about 1200 or 1300 AD. As they arrived, the Fremont people were passing from the scene, leaving their haunting images on canyon walls and their artifacts in village sites the length and breadth of Utah. Without a doubt, the most advanced of Utah's early peoples were those that built this village around 1200 AD. We call these people the Anasazi, after the Navajo word meaning the ancient ones. The Anasazi lived here at about the same time as the Fremont, and yet this village, masterfully conceived and erected, is a far cry from the subterranean pit house villages of the Fremont. This Anasazi bowl, its design bursting with creative energy, represents a far different level of achievement from the simple gray pottery of the Fremont. Whereas the Fremont had patches of corn, beans, and squash here and there, the Anasazi became heavily dependent upon agriculture. They built impressive systems of dams and canals so they could bring water to their fields, even when those fields were in terraced canyons or on the tops of high mesas. Since the Anasazi can be traced from about the time of Christ, about 500 years before the Fremont, one might think that the Fremont were simply an archaic people who copied in a clumsy way from the culture of their neighbors to the south. The facts suggest otherwise. The Utah Anasazi lived only in the southeastern part of the state. We find the earliest signs of Fremont culture, however, in the north. The Fremont artifacts of later periods are found progressively southward, exactly the opposite of what we would expect if the Fremont were country cousins feeding on crumbs from the Anasazi cultural table. More likely, the two groups had a common ancestor somewhere in the southwest. Their migrations over hundreds of years could have taken them on different geographic and cultural paths. <laughs> Because the cultural development of the Anasazi has been carefully studied, we know much more about them than we do about other prehistoric Southwest peoples. At least six developmental stages have been identified and dated. These stages cover their entire 1,300-year growth from a basket-making people barely distinguishable from the archaic desert tribes to their peak as accomplished farmers and masons at about the time this pueblo or village was built. The basket-making period extends from some time before 1 AD to about 750 AD. These exquisite baskets are examples from this stage. After 750 AD, the Anasazi developed rapidly in pottery-making, agriculture, and house-building. Their astonishing achievements in house-building had modest beginnings. The first pueblos were made of adobe and poles or adobe and stone or simply cut stone. 
They were grouped in L shapes, semicircles, and sometimes rectangles. Often a pit house would be at the center of such a village. A common structural feature was the hockle wall, made by setting a row of posts or logs upright in the ground close to one another and filling the spaces with mud or adobe. Such complexes became more elaborate over time until about 1150 AD. Then began the Great Pueblo period when they built large villages, often nestled under protective sandstone cliffs. The Pueblos could contain hundreds of rooms. Many of the walls were of fine masonry. Sometimes they were plastered with adobe and then decorated with red, yellow, and black designs. The Anasazi's great investment in such structures made sense only if they could stay put. Their development of agriculture made this possible. They raised not only corn, beans, and squash, but also cotton, spinning and dyeing and weaving the fibers into decorative patterns. In addition, they domesticated turkeys, adding dependable supplies of meat to their regular vegetable diet. Religious rituals became elaborately developed among the Anasazi. The pit house evolved into the kiva, or circular underground chamber entered by a ladder through a hole in the roof and used for religious and fraternal ceremonies. To their achievements in the decorative arts, they added turquoise necklaces, leather robes, and flint knives. Their pottery took a variety of forms and was skillfully decorated in contrasting black and white geometrical patterns. In 1300, at the height of their powers, the Anasazi disappeared. More than a thousand years of cultural development went with them. The Anasazi apparently just packed up and left. They headed south into Arizona and New Mexico, leaving their massive pueblos to the ravages of time, weather, and vandals. We still don't know why they left. Tree rings show a severe drought struck in 1276 and lasted most of the rest of the century, so perhaps they were simply starved out. Others have wondered if migrations of warlike historic Navajo and Apache from the north might have decimated the essentially peaceful and gentle Anasazi. We may never know the full answer, but it is clear that they with the Fremont disappeared from Utah about the year 1300, never to return. Though they've long since left, the legacy of the first Utahns, which began in marshes near here, is rich and powerful. It reminds us, among other things, that Utah has always been a crossroads. Over 10,000 years, several tides of people have swept across this land, settled down for shorter or longer periods of time, and then moved on. Although the various desert archaic people had little technology, they had a homing instinct for that vital zone where water meets desert land. There they enjoyed a long and from all appearances contented tenure. Their successors, the Fremont, a true crossroads people, borrowed freely from their predecessors and neighbors. Leaving the marshes, they spread out over the whole state and built an eclectic and vigorous civilization. Of all the early groups, they are identified most uniquely with our state. The Anasazi were brilliant outsiders whose Utah settlements were provincial and peripheral to their main residential centers. All of these ancient peoples were gentle. There's little evidence of warfare, their arts reflecting domestic and religious life. Understanding these peoples is useful in helping us to understand ourselves. If they could look at the salt marshes we avoid and see here a great opportunity for settled life, then we're made to pause and ask, what else do the limits of our culture keep us from seeing? Where are our blinders? History helps us to push back the blinders and broadens the field of our vision. And finally, their story is useful in giving us a sense of perspective on our own place in the totality of human experience here in the Great Basin. Whole civilizations have come here, settled down for thousands of years, and then 
disappeared from human ken. We know them only from what little they left behind. But fortunately, they left behind enough for us to know that these were alert, sentient, creative people. If we could somehow transport ourselves to their time, we'd surely find that not one of them ever expected to see the day when their race had ceased to exist. Not one could have imagined that their trinkets, their tools, their houses, their very bones would one day provide the stuff of romantic legend and folklore for a later people. It's hard for men to imagine that one day they might be the ancient ones. <laughs>